So to kick off this conversation, I'd like to give our speakers a chance to talk about how, first of all, how they became interested in their field of study, and then to also give a overview of their current research. So we can start with Professor Roth here. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Um, so I, I guess I was always interested in physics, and then my particular research area is sort of the study uh, of polymers, so long chain molecules, which falls under soft matter physics, which is physics without a crystal structure that's complicated and messy because it's got multiple, uh, you know, uh, some sort of complicated non-crystalline structure with multiple interactions. My my path into actually polymers was through a co-op I did uh, in high school and undergrad uh, with Xerox Research Center in Canada that was uh, studying uh, polymers in particular, like making new polymers for use as basically toner. So the, the print lettering that goes on paper and stuff like that. And so I had done this work and gotten interested in polymers. Uh, and then it turned out I could do that in graduate school. So I kind of sort of pursued it sort of that way. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear you talk about polymers because I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of students in the audience who are Emory students and Polymers is something we learned in organic chemistry. So it's kind of interesting to see, even though you are a professor in physics, to see that intersection. So I'm sure like there'll be a lot of intersection in the areas of research you both talk about. So that's really cool to hear. Yes. yes. Um, awesome. And Professor Van Voorhis, if you want to go ahead by your interest in chemistry originally and yeah. overview of your current research. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's interesting, you know, Connie was mentioning, you know, that she's always been interested in physics and I've always been interested in physics as well. I was just not as good at it as Connie is. Uh, so I didn't I didn't do very well in my physics classes. And so I took that as a hint that I should you know, move over and just apply physics to chemistry. I want to stay in my lane with that. Um, but seriously, I, I probably my first uh, memory of becoming really interested in science is, is kind of an ironic one. It was when I was in seventh grade, uh, there was a big, big announcement that made the news uh, that people had just, that some chemists had discovered fusion uh, in an electrochemical cell. Uh, and this was later determined to be uh, bogus. It was not correct. The, the science eventually won out, but that was not right. But when I was in seventh grade, I found that so fascinating that something that big could be undiscovered or even that people could be unsure if it was false. Uh, based on the disc, and I, so I said, you know, that's the kind of thing that I want to do. I want to, I want to study those kinds of problems. Uh, and I can't say that that I can draw a through line from the, my 13 year old self up to, you know, up to myself now. But, but it, it's probably not a coincidence that you know a lot of the problems we work on now uh, are renewable energy related, uh, and we actually do a fair bit in the lab that actually is related to electrochemistry. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think it does sort of tie together the things I was originally interested in, but, you know, using a new set of tools as I've, I've, I've grown up and learned new things. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. So the first question, or rather set of questions I have is, where do you come from in terms of approaching science and faith? Uh, what have your experiences been, if any, when it comes to these two topics together? And we can start with Professor Van Voorhis. Yeah. Um, thanks, Nathan. Sure. So, so for me, I grew up uh, going to church. Um, uh, in in a, my parents uh, were both Christians, um, but I actually left Christianity when I was in college, um, and uh, you know, only returned uh, late in my graduate career. And so, the result is that you know, while my faith is central to who I am, my ultimate final embrace of those beliefs only came after the majority of my sort of scientific development had happened. Uh, so I haven't, I've had to think a lot as an adult about how, how I fit those things together. And, and, you know, largely for myself within my own worldview, I find that they fit together quite, quite well. Uh, you know, the things that I've observed uh, about that maybe are more challenging um, is that I've, I've observed that many religiously devout individuals are, are pretty profoundly uneducated about science. Uh, and I don't necessarily think it's that their beliefs are in conflict with scientific evidence so much as they're just not engaging with science. Uh, and likewise, I've, I found that there are many deeply deep scientific thinkers who just are pretty uneducated about religion. And I don't think in many cases that they've, is that they've you know, analyzed everything and found it wrong. They just assume it to be not as important as science. Um, and so as someone who is both a scientist and a person of faith and an educator, I see sort of a tremendous opportunity here uh, if we can respect, as we come together to, if we can come together and respectfully discuss these topics. Um, so. Right. Oh, that's great. And 
And Professor Roth, I know a lot of students here at Emory, they either have that background in science and faith, or they just have the background in science. So I wanted to ask you about kind of your background with science and faith, either one, either or, and if you've had experiences when it comes to one or both of these topics. topics. So, so my original interest in science was by asking questions as a young child of, you know, why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? Why does the world work this way? Why this? Why that? And uh, not that my parents were at all educated in science, but my mother read a lot. And so her answer to my questions was, well, let's go to the library. And so, you know, I guess, uh, if, if you describe faith as trying to understand, you know, how the world works, then that was my, you know, sort of entrance into science. My family was uh, not religious at all. And to be quite honest, the way that religion appeared to me when I was a child was not in a flattering light. It was um, essentially presented in a way that was like, well, because the Bible says this, then you should do that To And I'm someone that doesn't I, I want to know why something is before I would agree or follow or something like this. And so that wasn't at all uh, appealing. And to add to that as well, uh, organized religion did not seem to present women in a particularly flattering light. And that was also, you know, part of my calculus as a young child. Uh, and so like it sort of never uh, appealed to me. Um, I would say, you know, like you tend to, as you get older and become an adult or whatever, you kind of sort of rethink things and where science is interesting and can explain, you know, sort of how nature works and how, uh, you know, things at that level works that where, where, you know, science maybe doesn't speak to is how society works or like how people interact. And uh, it turns out to do science, there's a lot of people interactions involved in that, right? And as you, and to do science well, turns out you actually have to manage a lot of people interactions. And uh, that's something they don't teach you at all in any science class. And so like that becomes part of like, you know, how do you uh, identify, you know, ways to interact with people who have differing, differing opinions and how do you set, you know, like how does, um, what are your values, right? And like, what is, you know, an important thing to like, you know, say the integrity of science and like how you're gonna do research, for instance, like that whole process, I think is informed by things that, you know, where, where I do think faith can, can like speak to. I actually was interested, Connie, with the way you started out. You you mentioned that, you know, for you, you had sort of your childhood, why the universe and so forth. Yes. And, and that, that was maybe sort of your faith experience, which I think is 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 a terrific analogy to make. And I was wondering, you know, do, have you, you know, found as you've gone deeper into that, do you find sort of within science sort of deeper sort of purpose driven answers, things like that? Um, I, I think of my research as sort of two different avenues. Like, so polymers has lots of applications, everything from, from energy efficient materials to nano scale technologies, advanced materials and that kind of thing. And certainly we do research trying to answer all those questions. And that is part of what gets pushed in terms of getting funding. But then um, physics has always appealed to me in the sense that it tries to ask very sort of fundamental questions and soft matter in general, like one of the big picture questions is, you know, how do messy, complicated things that are not just simple two particle interactions, you know, work and how much is, are there similarities between, you know, uh, a polymer that's a glass, so basically a frozen in molecular structure to say uh, a pile of sand and uh, window glass and, um, you know, emulsions and things like that. So like there's sort of, you know, something asking sort of fundamental questions at, at that level. And I all sort of, I guess, you know, if I've I do, you know, if you ask me if I have a faith, it would be, you know, science in that sense. And, you know, asking like, what is the fundamental question that governs, if there's something overarching that governs a lot of different areas, you know, that that does make you feel like you're peeking behind the curtain in terms of like trying to, 
understand some deeper meaning of the universe as it were, right? Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Now, those are, those are great points. And it's interesting to hear your, your like unique and interesting take on a different sense of faith that I think a lot of people in religion don't really think of in that sense. So that's, that's awesome. And actually leads me into my second question for you both. So as researchers in different STEM fields, what do you believe are the strengths and weaknesses of trusting science as a means of gaining knowledge? What about trusting faith and religion as a means of gaining knowledge? And we can start with Professor Roth. So uh, let's let's start first. Like, so when you do research, right, even though at the undergraduate level, things are separated into physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth. These are distinctions that were made like 100 years ago. Um, at the research level, everything is intermixed, right? So I do research that would equally fit, yes, under soft matter physics, but equally fit under physical chemistry in a chemistry department or in the material science and engineering department or, you know, like, so everything is sort of intermixed um, from that. And when you do research, it's always trying to push the envelope on like what we know or don't know. So I would say like the people that are, are doing the research are very clear in their mind for their field of, okay, this is what's known. This is what we suspect is true. And we have reasonably good things of like, you know, that, that this is likely true, but we haven't yet, you know, found completely the experiments that prove, you know, that, that show that you know, really definitively. And then we're speculating about what might be true. And there's only, you know, hints of information that, you know, this is, you know, perhaps right or whatever. And then we're fully aware that over here is a whole bunch of stuff that like we haven't the foggiest clue about stuff we don't know or whatever. And you sit at that forefront. And as you do science, ever slow, slowly, this evolves. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so. Maybe I'll hop on and we can talk about the science piece, you know, because, you know, I think that's that's a great sort of I, I would sort of share that same worldview about sort of the way that scientific thought moves forward. Uh, and I guess when I've always thought about weaknesses of science, I mean, I'd say that the strength and the weakness are actually kind of the same, uh, which is the strength of science is that it only ever provides one answer to a question. Uh, and the weakness is that it only ever provides one answer to a question. And the, red, and the situation of it being a strength or weakness is really whether the question has only one answer. Uh, because there are certain questions for which there is, where we expect that there will be one answer. Uh, you know, does the, does the sun revolve around the earth? I expect there to be one answer to that question. It's very well, you know, addressed by science. You know, but there's other things I think that relate to some of the sort of more people type things that you were mentioning, uh, Connie, uh, you know, that, that I think don't have just one answer. And when we try to boil those things down to science, I think we get ourselves in trouble because then we try to one dimensionalize things that aren't one dimensional. So, you know, one that comes up just for this is, you know, people, people might ask the question, why are we having this forum over Zoom? And there's not one answer to that question. You know, right, right. there's there's public health considerations. Maybe we want to minimize people's carbon footprint. Maybe the you know maybe Nathan has stock in Zoom. You know, there could be a, a whole bunch of reasons that we decided to do this. Uh, and none of them is you know exclusive of the others. It's just you know a lot of times it depends on what you know what context we're asking the question in or what layer of understanding we want for the why question. Um, uh, they say I mean, that that's always been yeah. Go ahead. Well, they say that often identifying the right question is like the hardest part of trying to sort of solve yeah. a, a scientific yeah. problem, right? And sort of defining that well. I would yeah. say the other part that where science has a weakness in terms, um, and this brings back to like how educated everybody else is about science. It is, uh, I have a really good understanding of where in my area, like what we know and don't know. And over time, my graduate students learn this of where that boundary is, right? And, and, and scientists tend to be very cautious about, yes, we know this and how well do we know what it is. But I think this is not at all appreciated by A, how we teach science in school mm -hmm. and by everybody else. And, you know, things are often presented, well, this new study showed this. And so therefore that must be true. And it's like, well, that's one study. And then you have to put it in the context of all the other things and maybe it wasn't done well or who knows, right? Like it, it is really sort of a body of science. 
And then mm-hmm. over time, we simplify things, right, by being able to look back and go, okay, you know, after many, many, many studies, we can agree on this thing. And then we put it in a textbook as if it's like, you know, practically etched in stone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think you're right, Connie. And I think, yeah, so people don't, you know, don't understand that sort of moving front where things are still, you know, you know where the boundary is, but other people don't. I think the other thing people don't understand is that even for the stuff that's behind the boundary, where, where I would say we know it, right? there still is the possibility that yes. I'm going to, I might go back to actually never mind. We don't know that I'm going to move that out of the node category because, you know, people doesn't, people do another study and they're like, Oh, wait, we don't, we'd actually, that just upends like, you know, this whole piece of what we knew before is different now. Yeah. The front is not a sharp line, right? Like there's yeah. stuff from like, you know, a hundred years ago that we're pretty darn sure. Yeah, we're and pretty, then, yeah. you know, the front is itself something that, probably spans, you know, 10, 20 years of research easily where, you know, you might still shift things in there. Yeah, absolutely. And I both amazing points. And it also brings up a follow-up question I want to ask you, Professor Van Verhis. So you mentioned like one of the drawbacks in science is that you can, sometimes it's often a one-dimensional answer. And I think on the other hand, with faith and religion, it can be multidimensional, but extremely, sometimes people think it's, it's complex and ambiguous and it, often draws people away from religion. So I'm curious to know, uh, what do you think are the drawbacks in terms of trusting faith and and religion Mm -hmm. in terms of gaining knowledge? Yeah, I mean, so I'll say that, you know, the the multidimensional answer, multidimensional nature of religious thought is important for, for, in my my experience, for for why questions, which are questions of purpose. Uh, They're important for should questions, which are questions about how the way things are deviate from the way we think they ought to be. I think the sort of multidimensional answers are important there. Um, And I don't think that there's really a weakness of religious thought per se, except for the fact that I I do see a tendency of some religious people to rely solely on religious thinking to the exclusion of all other forms of thinking. Um, And I think that's just very likely to lead to errors. Uh, You know, and I think, I think as, as, as religious people, we are, we are and ought to be committed to truth, uh, the discovery of truth and to the understanding of truth. And, you know, every tool that's available to us, to us is, are things that we should, um, you know, we should we should take a hold of. You know, uh, you know there are various re- various claims that relig- that people have made you know, on religious grounds that are just scientifically falsifiable, and we should be willing to do scientific studies and say, look, is this true? Um, and and I actually think that that's actually beneficial to the religious community because you know there are charlatans who will try to pull things over on people, uh, you know, pass off superstitions as true. Uh, and and science in particular plays a really important role in sort of cleaning the barnacles off the hull of religious knowledge uh, in that respect. Um, Can I ask a so, naive yeah. question? Yeah. Uh, in in relation to that, like how does how does understanding and religion evolve over time? Like you talk about trying to find the the truth, and what's the process by which you know understanding sort of evolves? Yeah, and that is that is a difference also, Connie, that you're, you're bringing up, which is that I, I I don't know that the idea of you know we have a body of things that we know religiously, and then there's a front that it think that we're building on that's exp- that's expanding over time. It's um, it, I don't necessarily have that view of religious knowledge. It it, it doesn't work in that way. Um, I would actually say that science is somewhat unique in that. Uh, in, the, in that world, in the fact, in the idea that that worldview really does capture this, at least in natural sciences, I think the most natural science would say that captures the way we think about things. Is, you know, we're just sort of building, building a bigger whole. You know, always standing on the shoulders of giants to, you know, steal the phrase from Newton. Um, uh, and, and I think the reason that religious knowledge isn't necessarily like that is like one of the key things that you that is important in religious knowledge is knowing yourself. Um, and that's not something that, you know, cause there are new people, but, you know, I'm new, you know, I can't necessarily take the knowledge that other people have of themselves and translate it to me. Uh, and also I might know, feel like I know myself very well, only to discover that I don't actually know myself that well, or that I have changed. Uh, and therefore that I, you know, I knew, know who I used to be, but now I don't know who I am, uh, any longer. Um, and I think some of those types of questions mean that, you know, okay, well, there's a constant sense of re-examination, uh, that happens there. 
But I, I don't think your, the analogy that you get for science would, would be accurate for religion. I don't think we can say, look, here's codified what we know, and then here's the boundary, and we're always expanding it. I, I think that probably would not be a, a good way to think about religious knowledge. Would it be more similar to like how society evolves in its views in terms of what's considered acceptable or not acceptable on various controversial topics that you know one could name? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's some things there. I mean, I would say that most religions probably say that there's some core of objective, immovable things. Uh, in fact, I'll be, I'm most familiar with Christianity and a handful of other religions. I, I, and I would call, I would, I would give, I have a term for that, which I would say there are certain creedal statements. Uh, there's some, you know, depending on what your tradition is, there's a longer or shorter number of them, but there's some number of things you say, you know, it's kind of like that we hold these truths to be self-evident kinds of statements. Mm -hmm. um, and for most religious traditions, they would say, these are the creedal statements, you know, these are never gonna change. We know they're always true. And then the things that change are sort of what grows out of that, uh, which then does, you know, as society changes, the ways that those things infiltrate the way we act in society is going to change as people change. You know, one thing I always like to point out as a chemist is that, or as a scientist is that, you know, there's, there's, there's been over the last century, such huge population growth uh, on, on the face of the earth that the, the ways in which we act as people now may be different than the ways we acted 200 years ago, just by sheer numbers that, uh, you know, if you have 8 billion people as opposed to 300 million, what is ethical is different. Um, and um, so I, I think th there's, th that would maybe be the way to think that I would think about it. It's like, you know, it's a seed that's constantly germinating or something like that. Um, but Can I ask another question on, on what yes, you said earlier? The distinction in this between, like you said, between science and, and, and religion or faith is that questions in faith are often multidimensional and sort of, you know, not a single answer kind of thing. Um, one of the things that happens as we grow up is like when we're young children, the world appears black and white. There is like, yes, and there's no certain, like, certainly related also to how we were brought up of like, this is the right thing to do. This is not the right thing to do. Yep. And then you grow up and you come to realize that, well, as a young adult, you appreciate nothing is black and white and everything is, you know, complicated <laughs> shades yes. of gray. Um, and I wonder, I guess, like how... Uh, in 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 like the teaching of faith at different levels, how like how is that transition from perhaps a black and white thinking to more a multidimensional gray mm -hmm. sort of thinking sort of presented uh, to people growing up and you know yeah, trying I, well, to appreciate yeah, all of the compl complexities yeah. of the world. Well, yeah, and I, I think you've hit on one of the difficulties that I, I mean that I had in college. Uh, you know, you know, versus, you know, is that, you know, you come to be an adult and you say, okay, wait, well, some of the things that I thought were black and white, maybe are not black and white. Uh, that's, you know, one of the transitions that you make. And then, you know, there are big issues that, that hit you that you thought you'd be ready to deal with that you actually discover you're not ready to deal with. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think that, you know, I, I, that, you know, for me that, that was, that was difficult. Uh, and it, that was one of the reasons that I, you know, I, I went away from, you know, I, I walked away from things for a long time, um, uh, you know, and I think, you know, with many more years of hindsight, I can say, well, I, I wasn't necessarily unique in that, uh, even though, of course, I felt very unique and special, as we all do when we're, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, I'm the first person to ever go through this. Uh, right. but, you know, I look back and I'm like, I, well, actually, I was not that unique. I was I was kind of, you know, typical. Yeah. Um, At 13, everything was totally black and white. This is right. This is wrong. And then you grow up and you're like, oh, crap, that wasn't so. Yeah. And then you have to rethink almost everything. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you both for your comments. And what's interesting is you both mentioned in your in your explanations, the pursuit of truth. And I think especially in what we hear a lot is we we hear that science versus faith is portrayed as a conflict, but really these are both ways that we can pursue truth. So it's really interesting to hear both of these views and how you both have that motivation to pursue truth. And I wanna follow up with a very quick question for both of you. So as you probably know from your own experiences in research and in STEM, the pursuit of truth often requires 
a lot or often includes a lot of challenges. So I'm curious to know, and we can start start with Professor Roth, whether it's generally in the fit in the field of physics or specific to your research or both, what are some of those big challenges that you've encountered in terms of pursuing that truth and advancing knowledge in the field of physics? I mean, there's the mechanics of doing research and as an experimentalist, not all experiments work. And so there's just the like getting that to work. Um, but like, you kind of know that going in, mm-hmm. um, there's also the piece of like research is done by people. Right. And so, um, And certainly in an academic environment, research is done by students, graduate students primarily, but also undergraduate students where, you know, these are people that for which, you know, they are coming to appreciate that everything is complicated and gray and not simply black and white. And so sometimes then you have like, um, you know, as it were, I don't want to say people issues, but like just in terms of like, you know, uh, the, the, what's it like, you know, so that people stay motivated to deal with doing research that can be quite frustrating often. Um, and you know, the interactions of like, if people do collaborations or work together on a project, how those interpersonal interactions work and things like that. And often I would say, uh, this is what I've come to appreciate. I say this also having been like director of graduate studies, for instance, is that, you know, the people piece of how we carry out research, I would say is by far probably the more complicated piece in terms of like trying to sort of sort that out. And this is where um, something like faith or certainly like having a clear understanding of, you know, values and integrity uh, are important especially in terms of like, you know, best ethics in terms of how to publish your work, how to present the results that you have in the best, you know, yes, in the best light, but at the same time being accurate of what is known and not known or reliable about your results and, you know, how to teach that as well to your students. So I would say like that is often the more sort of complicated piece. Yeah, I, I I I agree with you, Connie. That I think the the people pieces can be complicated is very complicated, and I think there's also the issue of like just the mechanics of doing things, and when it's not working, it's discouraging, uh, and you ask questions about: Am I ever going to succeed? Am I ever going to make it? Is this ever going to work, or am I just wasting my time? And I, I mean, and I also think sometimes, even if for some of the things I'm working on, I'll think: Well, even if this does work, is it really going to matter? Uh, because you know, you know, being fair, you know, much of the research that we that that I do is you know curiosity based, and a lot of curiosity based stuff may end up may it may turn out that it only satisfies my curiosity. Um, uh, no one else may be curious about it besides me. Um, uh, and uh, and you know, we're all all of us who are doing fundamental science are kind of you know casting a line out there to try to catch something and, you know, what if I never catch anything? You know, those kinds of things I think are always big struggles. Um, And and I do think that, you know, having that faith is helpful in that because, you know, in Christianity, I, you know, I believe in a God who is there with us in struggles, who's there and, you know, and is present and doesn't ignore those struggles. Um, And that's been very important for me. Um, And I think the other thing that is sometimes difficult for me on the people side. Um, and I, I hesitate to say this because I don't want to make my scientific colleagues sound too bad, but there are you know, many people in, who I encounter in science for whom their scientific reputation is very, very, very important to them. Uh, maybe I can put it in that most kind way, but that doesn't necessarily, it's important to the exclusion of other things that I would call sort of just normal basic human values um, uh, to where, you know, preserving, I'll put, I'll call it myself, preserving my own scientific reputation, I will use to justify just about anything. Um, and that's, that's always difficult for me to, go ahead. I'm um, just, can you parse that at the level of like, 
scientific reputation related to like ego versus scientific reputation related to like integrity of the science. Because yeah, part so, of yeah. like how our community views us is also like, well, uh, yeah. you know. No, I, I'm, I'm speaking more related to the ego. That's what um, I thought. Uh, of course, there's a there's a gray line of what is ego and what is this really is what is right. I really ought to be recognized and, and what is rightful recognition for accomplishments. Um, so I wouldn't say that I, I can always say that it's ego. Sometimes they might be right, uh, but it, they, they can it can often be quite difficult. Um, and I do think actually that faith for me plays an, an, an important role in that also in terms of, you know, helping me to be you know, not so attached to that, to be a little bit less ego driven, to be more, to have a sense of humility that, you know, this is not, you know, I'm not all that and this is not. And even if I was all that, my reputation is not the most important thing to me. Um, uh, so, you know, th those are important things for me in terms of, you know, that the, 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 there are challenges on the people side uh, that that I, I do often, you know, I, I read lots of scriptures about humility and remind myself, you know, that just because someone else is having a, you know, an ego trip, it doesn't actually help for me to have an ego trip to try to get them to calm down. That's the, the, the response is humility in the face of, of, uh, of arrogance. So. A piece of scientific reputation that I've always been the most careful of is that like our lab does good work because there are certainly mm -hmm. people in my field for which Mm, I feel they cut corners or, you know, they've done conflicting things or whatever. And because they've done that a couple of times, I no longer really like necessarily trust anything that's coming out of their lab or I take, you know, everything they do with a grain of salt, even if they yep. publish something new or whatever. And so like, that would be the piece that, you know, I would want to be like, I want to be sure that what we're presenting in terms of actually publishing for posterity in some sense is, you know, accurate to the best of our ability. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Thank one, you so one much. Of the MIT chemistry values is integrity. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Great. Thank you so much for your, for your comments. So actually this last question I have, you both touched on already to a great degree, but I'll, I'll just ask it anyway. So what what is the relationship between religion and science? And to what extent do you think they are compatible? And I'll start with Professor Van Voorhis. Yeah, I think the place where religion and science, um, I mean, I guess, first of all, I think they're compatible, which is, you know, just a big shocker for me. I'm sure nobody thought that I was going to say that. Um, but, you know, I think the place where they come into play with each other is in decision questions. Um, so, you know, we can talk about abstract knowledge claims and so forth, but the, the place where science uh, and, and, and religion, I think, really come together is when we're trying to make a decision. Um, uh, you know, the risks we're willing to take uh, and those we choose to avoid, the things we decide to do with our lives, because those aren't really based on like one, just one form of knowledge. Um, there's, there's various things that come to bear on that. In fact, I would say that, you know, there's not... Uh, there, there's a there's not really any decision that religious knowledge cannot contribute positively to, and I would say that's the same of science. Science, there's not a single decision that scientific knowledge cannot contribute positively to. Um, it's you know it's just a matter of you know how those those different bits of knowledge get combined in terms of our decision making process. Um, you know you know take a you know current example. I'm sure that many there are many students listening who are going to have to decide tomorrow whether they want to go to class. And I'm sure that there's some scientific knowledge about the rates of COVID-19 in the area and the effectiveness of wearing masks and their own health status. I hope all of that scientific knowledge will factor into their decision of where they want to go to class. There's also probably questions about how much they love knowledge uh, and the value of spending time with their peers uh, and uh, you know how wonderful the instruction is. Those will be factors that come in. You know, but these are all. Um, things that, that come together, it's not, you know, it's, it, the, the decision has many factors in it in terms of how we make that, make that choice. And I think there are, there are a number of things about that, you know, religious knowledge is, if nothing else, designed to help us make decisions about our lives. Uh, and I think if you don't also take into account, you know, scientific knowledge, which is good at predicting consequences of actions, uh, if nothing else, uh, if not values of them, uh, you know, you need to know what the, like the consequences are going to be. And, and I think science is really important for those things. So that's sort of, if I, if I see them as, you know, being compatible, I see them as sort of, you know, as, as, as two sort of 
pillars upon which we can build this, we, we build decisions uh, with other, you know, pillars also. I would, I would add to that. I like the idea of thinking about it in terms of decisions, but I would add to that. There are like small decisions and big decisions. So like a small decision would be, um, in terms of certain, we're not, we're not necessarily small decision, but like something that like sort of everyday things would be deciding, you know, who's part of the authorship of this publication when there's multiple people working on a project. And these are kinds of things that, you know, are questions associated with values and ethics, right? And there's actually part now, uh, as of some five plus years ago, something that both the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health have required that is part of the teaching for graduate students doing research, um, because these are important questions that, you know, historically haven't necessarily been part of the education. And then I also think science and faith have, or, you know, values are really important in terms of really big questions associated with sort of our society. So like science will make things, um, you know, like nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs. And then of course, you know, should we be using them? And that's, you know, the thing that was made, you know, 70 years ago now. Um, but, you know, there's equal questions sort of happening in terms of like in biology to the extent that we can make alterations to our DNA should we be doing any of that? And then, uh, you know, in terms of computer science, we're hitting on artificial intelligence and all sorts of things. So like, you know, science allows us to do many things. And then the decision piece is, should we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, so technically there's four more minutes until audience questions, but I do want to bring in one as a follow-up just because it's related to our talk about the compatibility of science and faith. And this one is for you, Professor Van Voorhis. So, um, so Hope asks, have you ever been looked down upon by colleagues or others in your field because of your faith? Yeah, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, not, 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 they, I, if they do, they haven't said it to my face, I guess. <laughs> the, uh, but, uh, you know, I, you know, I think the closest I ever got to that was um, you know I've I've done a I've done a number of talks and and discussions and panels like this and so forth and uh, one of my uh, one of my colleagues had you know seen several of them on you know they googled me and it, one of these came up and they watched it and so forth and they gave me a a very careful warning they said I think it's great I you know I watched I really you know enjoyed what you had to say but you should be careful with what you have to say because you know. Ultimately, you might want to get into the National Academy someday, and I don't know if they're going to like that. Uh, so it was not that person looking down on me, but they thought that someone else might look down on me. Uh, and I was, you know, for a moment, I was afraid of that. And I was like, well, you know, if that happens, that happens. It's you know, not, not under my control. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think there is... And in, I, I, so I haven't ever encountered anyone face to face who I felt like looked down on me, but there are people I think who expect others will look down on me for it. So you can take that for what it's worth, I guess. Maybe people have uh, lower expectations of others than they have of themselves, maybe. Mm. To be honest, I find that surprising because I've never really ever thought from any of my colleagues, what do they think in this area? Like it was just, it's never something that's ever crossed my mind. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's I would say, Connie. I would say that's by and large that that what I've encountered too is that I could say nobody's looked down at me because I mean I don't, I don't know that they look down or up or even sideways at me. Right. <laughs> it's just you know it's just not something that 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 they that they're you know asking about. And then the ones who are sort of in you know into asking those kinds of questions have been very respectful. Um, uh, and so I would say like the one piece is like you know what are the values of the other people that you're working with, right? And that yeah. certainly, you know, is a piece to it of which I would assume that religion and faith informs what a person's values are. Yeah, absolutely. And one more quick question for both of you before we go to the Q&A is, a lot of students in the audience here are interested in pursuing uh, research or careers in fields of STEM. So what advice would you give them as they really want to pursue these STEM endeavors? And we can start with uh, Professor Roth. So hmm, I'll try and keep this, I guess the, probably the central piece I would say is the separation of physics, chemistry, and biology 
um, doesn't really happen once you leave undergrad. And so having as much as possible a broad knowledge of you know, multiple areas of science, I think is highly beneficial. And I say this from like experience because I didn't do this. You know, I studied physics and took my one requisite like intro physics or intro chemistry in my freshman year and then promptly thought, never going to have to deal with chemistry again. And then <laughs> turned out my research is like completely overlapping with chemistry. And so I had to sort of go back and learn, you know, stuff that perhaps I should have learned as an undergrad to the point that as a young assistant professor, I went and sat in on the whole year of organic chemistry here. Uh, you know, the person at the back of the class, please, you know, just teach me uh, the stuff. And part of it had to do with the fact that I was now responsible, right, as a professor for writing things in publications and not getting them wrong, like, and not getting stupid stuff wrong, like, is that an ether group or an ester group? I'm not really, you know, and so it is, if you don't learn it as an undergrad, uh, there's possible that you're going to have to go back and learn it on your own. Yeah, and the yeah, same I question. I, yeah, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I, guess I, I guess I would say, you know, piggybacking on what Connie said, I, I, I think she's right. I would completely agree that, you know, if, if you're interested in getting into science, I, I think what you want to get to is a point not where you feel like you know everything, but where you're, 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 you, you're willing to just learn whatever is necessary. Uh, and there's a certain amount of basic knowledge that you need to acquire before you have those skills. Uh, to be able to, you know, as Connie, as Connie did, just, you know, go and just sit in on an organic chemistry class and actually understand what's going on. You need to have some basic skills to be able to do that. Uh, but that's the kind of thing in science that we have to do all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've had to learn a bunch of, bunch of topics that I had, I knew nothing about when I started as a faculty member, but I've had to read textbook, you know, textbook introductory graduate level material about just to become sort of not stupid uh, when I talk about it. Um, but, you know, I think becoming a scientist is sort of getting enough skills that you know how to self-teach these things, you know, through trial and error and, and, and haltingly. Um, and I think the other thing that goes with that, I think, is that you need to have a, a, an attitude of embracing failure. Um, so science is a lot of failure and very few successes. Uh, even the most successful scientists, that's the story of their scientific career. Uh, and you just, you embrace the failure, you move on for, you know, you don't mourn it, give yourself some morning time, like know that failure hurts and is sad, and then you pick yourself up and you, you move on. Um, and, and I think that's kind of something you have to cultivate um, to, you know, throughout your life. So if, you, if, if, you're, if you're in that period where you feel like things aren't working out, that's part of the, the life cycle of a scientist, uh, and, and, and know that there, there's a, a, a dawn that comes at the, at the end of the night, so... I guess to, to just sort of directly answer your question, I would say it matters less what specifically your major is in terms of science. Um, but I will say that the last time you're ever formally taught something is an undergrad in terms of classes and maybe a few classes in graduate school. And learning something when people just teach it to you is way easier than learning something when you have to learn it yourself out of a book. So prioritize the really hard classes in undergrad because they're hard to learn on your own than, you know, kind of the easy classes that would be easier to learn on your own later if you need to. No, that's all wonderful <laughs> advice. And honestly, as a senior going through it, I would give the same advice to freshmen. So it's funny how that works out, especially a lot of students going through their first experiences in research here. They get that taste of failure and it happens a lot. So, but it's part of the process as you both talked about. So thank you so much for your comments. So we do have a, a good amount of questions here. So we'll go ahead and turn to the uh, Q&R portion. And the first one is a very complex one. So that's fun. Um, so it is perhaps more biology related, but I would love to hear your perspective about religion and the theory of evolution. So whoever would like to go first, go for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I could I could take a stab at that one, <laughs> let Connie off the hook or, for now. I, um, you know, I think 
Um, my position on on evolution uh, and and religion is, you know, I talked about already about creedal statements, um, which are statements that different religions take as being, you know, self evident, uh, uh, certainly true, uh, and uh, it's my um, uh, sincere understanding that evolution is not a creedal belief, or, or sorry, creationism, which would be the opposite of evolution, is not a creedal belief of Christianity. Um, uh, in fact, you know, I think there are very few of the world religions that have creedal beliefs about uh, origins. Um, uh, and so I think that, you know, my understanding is that, that therefore within Christianity, uh, origins, origins of life type questions are things where you know, yes, religious knowledge, you know, religious, you know, uh, investigation has something to say about that, but in the sense of, you know, religious investigation doesn't provide you just the one answer, as we discussed, you know, it provides, depending on what you say, you know, what is the origin, you know, the, what that origin can have, is going to have many different sources from a religious perspective, but it, it's not, it's certainly not something that is somehow sheltered from or uh, immune from scientific study. And I, I think that, you know, the theory of evolution is, is, is the current scientific best understanding of the origin of life. And I think as Christians, we need to understand what biologists are talking about when they talk about evolution. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so that's my, my position on that. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in all world religions. So there may be some world religions that are creedally in conflict with evolution, but I don't think Christianity is one of them. I think in my mind, this was kind of why I asked, like, how does uh, truth or understanding in in different faiths get updated over time? Right. Science is very good about we know, you know, we can say something about these things and then we haven't gotten to this. So we can't say anything about this. Right. So there are things that we can and can't. And that evolves over time. Right. Where, you know, we can say something about sort of the origin of the species now, where a thousand or 2000 years ago, we couldn't. And, you know, I assume that faith and religions often have to uh, say something about topics for which there isn't a scientific answer yet, right? And certainly there were, you know, various things that were put forth many, many, many years ago. And that's why I kind of asked the question is, as science evolves, in, in its understanding of providing new information, how does that impact then yeah. truth and understanding in, you know, in the context yeah. of, of religion? Yeah, and I guess to, to piggyback on that, Connie, I mean, I, we can look historically at some of these things uh, and you know, over time, because there are older scientific questions that are now not as controversial, like you know, does the sun revolve around the earth? Right. And you know, I think we all know this. Not we may not know all the details, but everyone knows that there was conflict between mm -hmm. the Christian, the Catholic Church, and and the scientific establishment, the emerging scientific establishment over that point. Um, but the the current position of the Catholic Church uh, is that. Catholics can believe either that the sun revolves around the earth or that the earth revolves around the sun. It is not a creedal statement. It's not like it's not that the Catholics have now said, oh, Catholics must believe that the sun, the earth revolves around the sun. It's the, the, the realization of, wait a minute, this is something that is, you know, it's not a statement that is Catholic. Uh, it's not something that, that, that we would own as, you know, so if there's somebody who's uneducated and doesn't know this, that's not going to affect their status as being a, a good Catholic. Um, so, you know, so that, that's, that, that's, I think, you know, in terms of how things evolve, you know, I think there, there's that evolution of realizing when there are things that it's like, oh, wait, this is actually not, you know, not, not creed. This is just, you know, this is, this is something where other forms of knowledge have actually advanced things or, or are better suited to advancing something. So. Awesome. Thank you so much for your comments. So this next question is specifically for Dr. Van Burhus. So um, Vani asks, how has science, if it has affirmed your faith journey? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, um, you know, there are various things uh, about science that, that, that are reassuring. Um, you know, I, I think the, you know, that are, that are sort of reassuring to me in terms of how I think about things, because there are, you know, there are various questions that I think are pretty difficult to answer. Um, uh, and as someone who does a lot of 
mathematics applied to the universe. I mean, one of them is the, is the simple question of why does math work so well in describing the universe around us? Um, that's that's one, one question that I have difficult, I have difficulty even conceiving of how answer, science would answer that question because it's that kind of question that's, it's a why question, it's a purpose question. It, you know, that math works, we can, we can validate, but why does it work so well? Um, and the, the, the other questions are somewhat similar ones of, you know, why is there a universe to begin with? You know, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, is another one of the questions that I think does sort of point to the incompleteness of science as, a, as you know, sort of the, the empirical natural sciences as a worldview. And then the other one that does strike me on a more personal level um, is, you know, not why does math work, why, not why does the universe work, but why is it that human brains uh, are so good at understanding the way that the universe works? Uh, and, uh, you know, galaxies, black holes, you know, things that we have no, that, that are not evolutionary beneficial. It's not evolutionarily beneficial for us to be able to understand those things. Uh, and yet we can, uh, which, uh, again, is, is something that, you know, at, at the very least points towards something, again, beyond just the sort of a, a purely materialistic, naturalistic view of things for me. Um, uh, and those are all things that, that I think science does highlight, if only in relief. In other words, you know, science cuts out this trend and you say, well, but then what's over here? And you say, well, we're never going to be able to go there. Uh, and you say, well, seems like there's, there's, seems like there's a there there, even though we can't get there. Great. Thanks so much. And so I, I think this question is also for Professor Van Voorhis, but if both of you would like to chime in, feel free to. So the next question is, is, what do you turn to when science and religion contradict each other? Mm, mm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't actually see science and religion contradicting each other in practice. Um, you know, I think I mean, certainly science, there are scientists and religious people who contradict each other uh, in terms of what either advice they give or how they, uh, how they choose to do things. But you know, it's it's never uh, you know never direct contradiction. Sometimes there certainly, I guess, if I was to reframe that, I'd say there certainly there are times where if you say if you place a lot of weight on scientific evidence, uh, which again, in most of the decisions we make, the scientific evidence is still in that gray zone that Connie and I have been talking about, where we're kind of mostly sure, but not entirely sure. Um, you know, that's where the decisions are 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 most most complicated. So when you're in that situation where you've got a decision where the science provides some direction, but it's in the gray zone, but maybe your understanding of your religious tradition may also push you in another direction and how you actually uh, come to uh, grips or a decision in, in that situation, I think is the, is the challenge. Um, and there, I think, you know, there's, it's not much different than, it, than any other kind of knowledge that would come to bear, which is that, you know, I think nothing excuses us from having to think things through uh, and to talk them through. And if you're and in Christianity, we have another avenue, which is prayer, which is also a way it's a conversation with God. And it's it's thinking about things and bringing God into the conversation. Um, I think there's you know, we have no excuse to not use all of those things if we have have a decision where you know the different forms of evidence seem to be in conflict. I would, I would add to that, I mean, along the lines that we've been talking, there's lots of things that are complicated and messy, hence sort of the gray sort of area. And I would say when you encounter something like that, and especially if you're in a position where you have to make a decision about something in this sort of gray area, um, the idea of sort of reflecting back on your own values and what, what you know, are the things that are meaningful to you in terms of like what is important in terms of making that decision usually sort of has that sort of biggest impact. Um, I'm pretty sure I've read somewhere in terms of like our biology, we get the most anxious when we do things that are contrary to our own values. So it's part of like knowing and understanding your own values because that will, you know, ultimately bring you peace into what like with whatever decision you make as opposed to being sort of, you know, very anxious. Like I'm the most anxious if I'm feeling like I'm forced to make a decision in a way that's contrary to my own values. Um, and I would, I guess the piece that I've come to think related to, to prayer, which I don't do, but I do believe strongly in the importance of like reflecting on your own thoughts and having downtime, uh, you know, with your own thoughts 
which is something that our current society that has, you know, input from social media and email and everything all day long is, it's, I think it's very important to di- be able to disconnect and reflect on the things that are important to you and how, you know, eventually how to sort of deal with, you know, making a decision in this gray area. And often it can be that disconnecting allows your subconscious to sort of deal with all of the complicated mess and sort of arrive at things. 